Okay, everybody, let's go ahead and do the meeting. Beginning ritual. 起立。面向佛堂,参加圣职工,一职工,三职工,三职工,参加各位点传是一职工,开班一职工,请坐下,please be seated. Okay, ready to uh, rock and roll. Wonderful. Wonderful. Muting microphone now. Good morning, everybody, or good afternoon or evening, depending upon the time zone that you're all in. It is a uh, <laughs> a beautiful, partly sunny, actually fairly warm day in Indianapolis today. Uh, and it's a bit above freezing, which is uh, always nice here in the winter. <laughs> For those of you who follow the weather from time to time, uh, we've already had our fair share of freezing rain and sleet and snow and what have you. And the winter's just barely getting started. I can uh, hardly wait to see what happens in January and February. <laughs> but that notwithstanding, it is uh, still a wonderful day to be alive. It is a, a wonderful day to be able to get together and, and share the spiritual pursuit of cultivating the Tao teachings, of trying to grow and refine ourselves spiritually as well as in our day-to-day -day mundane lives. I'm going to uh, try to be very clear and enunciate well. For those of you who don't know, I have a brand new set of uh, front teeth and I'm finding out that the uh, uh, that the appliance makes speaking clearly a bit difficult, so I'll be careful. <laughs> Every year around this time, I start thinking about uh, the coming new year and uh, the end of the old year, and the passage of time, and what I've been able to do and what I plan to do, and. Uh, uh, how I see the, the the future year unfolding, if you will. I uh, spend a bit of time contemplating uh, the goals and ideals that I've set for myself and kind of uh, measuring how I, I think I've done over time. And it always gives me pause to reflect when I start thinking about those things, about all of the truly remarkable and wonderful things that I've seen in my 57 years on this planet. You know, when I started out in life, <laughs> there, there were no personal computers. I have a, or had an aunt, my grandmother's sister, who actually remembered uh, the, the days before readily available commercial air air travel where uh, the Greyhound bus was still the, the predominant way to get around and where air travel was a, a pretty big and inconvenient deal. And in fact, in, in my own childhood, I had occasion to fly from North Carolina to Indiana uh, one year on an Eastern Airlines Constellation four-engine prop uh, uh, plane. It was a a turboprop aircraft and didn't have any jet engines on it. I have seen some truly remarkable and wonderful things in my 50 odd years and I can hardly wait to see what the, the next 50 bring. For those of you who are in your, your 20s and 30s, you're the generation that's going to shape uh, the future in the next couple of decades or so. You will be witnesses to the evolution of tremendous technology in virtually every field of human endeavor. You'll have the opportunity to help to choose the ways in which our technology and our discoveries uh, impact humankind and, and how those technologies are used. 
And that's both a really cool thing to be able to do and an awesome responsibility. You know, the age of a GPS and the cellular phone brought about global communications in an instantaneous fashion, and yet those same th same things gave us uh, unmanned drones and the ability to uh, uh, to spy on our own citizens and deliver uh, bombs and all sorts of other uh, untoward outcomes to people we consider our enemies. And so, in thinking about what the coming year is going to bring and what we're going to do with what we have, you know, we can't ever not think about that responsibility. But to a much more practical, day-to-day -day sort of a uh, way of thinking, you know, when I think about the, the coming year, I think about that naturally in terms of uh, myself and my family. I remember that I have uh, much fewer days ahead of me than I have behind me. That's a, a perfectly natural progression. It's not something that scares me, but it is something I consider from time to time. And I, and I sit here and I think, well, okay, if that be in the case, what is it that, that really scares me? Is there anything that causes me uh, untoward or excessive anxiety or stress? And that's a question we can all answer. What is it that we'll fear in the coming year? Will we fear dying or, or becoming impoverished? Will we fear remaining or becoming alone? Do we fear or worry about hunger in our lives or violence in our lives? You know, just just existing on this planet can give us plenty of reasons to be afraid, plenty of reasons to worry. I don't spend an inordinate amount of time thinking about my own death, but I spend an appropriate amount of time thinking about it so that when that day comes, you know, I'm prepared to go and I've done the best that I could do to take care of my family so that my passing doesn't cause them undue stress and grief. What I tell my, uh, what I tell my wife is, is that I want her to give me my 15 minutes of grief and then have me cremated, put me up on the mantle next to the flower pot, and get on about living. I don't really worry about becoming impoverished. Maybe I should. You know, very many of us are, uh, you know, one or two paychecks away from a, uh, perhaps living on the street. And that seems to be a very common condition in the U.S. these days where there's a, not a lot of job security and still an awful lot of people looking for work. And in modern times, unlike in times past, there is a, a tremendous amount of uh, competition, particularly in the technical fields uh, from offshore businesses that are attractive because they're inexpensive and because the people that they employ are really, really sharp people who understand the technology that they work with. So how come I don't worry about becoming impoverished? Why don't I worry about being one or two paychecks away from, from being out in the cold? Well, I'll tell you why. Uh, I have never, since I was 14 years old, gone for more than a week without a job. I have, uh, I've seen businesses fold up around me. <laughs> Always a, a fun and interesting thing. Uh, I've been victimized by reductions in force. Uh, there was one case in which uh, some of the things my employer was involved in made it untenable for me to remain there. But I've always had the ability to go out and find something to do, you know, to pay the mortgage and put food on the table. And so I've never never been really concerned about being unable to support myself. Do I worry about loneliness? Well, not really. If my wife passes before I do, which I 
tell her is completely unnatural and not allowed, <laughs> then yes, I, I will grieve and, and I will miss her terribly. But I'm also content in my own solitude. And I have a house full of wonderful children. And so I can't afford myself the luxury of a of a self pity and wallowing wallowing around in uh, uh, in stagnation and grief and worry. I don't worry about going hungry. I don't worry about my children going hungry. But I worry about other people going hungry. I see it every day when I go to work, and the the plight is truly terrible. There are uh, the homeless and destitute and displaced persons all around the downtown area of this city, and that's not unusual in any other metropolitan location in the world. LA has them, Taiwan has them, Europe has them. You cannot escape the fact that there will always be those who, because of circumstance or uh, some other cause, are stuck uh, in a less than auspicious existence. But because we live teachings of compassion and service to others, although I don't worry about me being hungry, that whole set of thinking is secondary to my being able to occasionally help someone who's worried about being hungry not worry about it today. Same thing for violence. I'm not really the kind of person that people tend to pick on. Most people don't come up to me looking for a conflict or a fight. I appreciate that. But there are so many who are the victims of, of violence in their homes, in their lives, you know, in their relationships. Once again, because we live teachings of compassion and service to others, there are opportunities there to help alleviate that suffering, to help remove uh, those fears from the lives of those people, even if it's just for a little while. And so, just as being alive gives us a reason to fear, it gives us uh, a reason and an avenue to practice the very things that we teach here, to use the compassion and service to others that we're supposed to be learning and practicing to good effect in the lives of those who do worry about these things. I think about what it is that we'll continue to cling to. Particularly in my life, I tend to be something of a pack rat. Um, I think it goes along maybe with uh, being involved in technology, you just never know when those uh, five and a quarter inch floppy diskettes will come back into vogue. <laughs> oh dear. The truth of the matter is, uh, I need to unclutter from time to time. You know, do I cling to money? I suppose to a certain degree, yes. Uh, having it and not having it, both. Uh, can cause a certain amount of anxiety. Not having it, I think, causes more anxiety than having it. Having too much of it is a cause of substantial fear because the money itself and what it represents becomes a target for those who would, uh, who would take it from us. Do we worry about our finances? And if we're worrying about them, is it because we're not managing them right? Is it because perhaps in uh, that area of the teachings we haven't quite mastered how to get control of, of money and the management of it to become better stewards of the resources that we have so that we take care of ourselves and our families and have enough to take care of others as well? Do we cling to a significant other or 
a group of people in our lives, perhaps a circle of friends or acquaintances, people we work with, a wife or a husband, children. Some of those attachments are, are very natural and really hard to break. And they serve an essential purpose in our lives in some cases. Uh, in the case of a husband and wife, father and child, mother and child, those attachments create the bonds that make the relationships and the family work. But with those bonds, with those attachments, also comes the guarantee of some suffering. Every relationship ends one day, either by death or divorce, right? Either somebody passes away or there's a mutual separation. And when that day comes, then there is a period of adjustment and pain and grief. It's unavoidable. Should we give up those attachments? Yeah, I'm not sure. But it's something I think about this time of year. I work very hard to make the things that I identify as hard and fast attachments closer to preferences. But I got to tell you, I can't give up being attached to my wife and my children. Do we cling to our possessions? Do we form attachments to the stuff that we own, the stuff we think we own, the trinkets and baubles that are significant of a life of some 50 odd years? We can't take any of it with us when we go, but we sure can't give it up while we're here. <laughs> that is the, uh, <laughs> the insidious nature of that attachment, the attachment to uh, stuff. We don't need most of it, but we won't let it go either. Part of the uncluttering process is practicing both letting go uh, of the junk in our lives that we don't need, the stuff that fills up our garages and attics and what have you. Some of it we drag around with us from one home to another and never open the boxes we packed it in. And yet after five, eight, ten years, the boxes are still sitting there unopened. What does that say about the stuff that's in them? Do we need it? Probably not. We say over and over again here that the process of uncluttering the home is practice for the, the job of uncluttering the heart. At the time where we decide to clean house, where we get rid of the stuff, where we make room for what we need instead of what we're holding on to, we symbolically do the same thing in our heart. We make room, not just for what we're hanging on to, but for what we need. Will we cling to our beliefs, our values, the things that we hold dear that may or may not be functioning for us anymore? Or will we have the courage to let go and perhaps seek out a better or different set of answers? Or at least see a wider view? Will we cling to our lives, this physical existence on this planet? Are we going to be the folks who, who fight death, tooth, hammer, and tong till the very end? Or when we finally meet death, will we find him as an old friend? Knowing that uh, we've been here before and likely will be again until the day comes when we're enlightened and the fear leaves us and we're able to exit this existence with a certain amount of grace, understanding that it simply is a natural process of living. I contemplate those things from time to time. It helps me when I think about them to adjust my worldview, to adjust the view of my spirituality, to try to, to widen the field that I look at at any given time. I think about what my attachments do for me and whether or not I need to keep them. 
whether or not they're really that doggone important or if they're just weighing me down in my quest for progress down the path of the Tao teachings. The longer I think about them and the more years go past me, the more I realize that the vast majority uh, of the attachments that I used to carry with me were completely unnecessary. And that by turning attachments and desires into preferences, I'm able to relieve myself of the need for a particular outcome in any given situation, which gives me the ability to be a lot more flexible and a lot less obnoxious. Those are uh, positive things. And so I challenge each of you to make that same examination. What will we accomplish in the coming year? Perhaps that promotion, professional growth, an increase in stature and prestige, more money, all of the things that are uh, significant among uh, secular accomplishment. And if we're doing that, will we also make room for spiritual refinement for a few additional steps down the path? Will we be able to incorporate that into a life with more compassion, with more selflessness, with more service to others? Where is it that we'll spend our time and our energies in the coming year? Now, I've got to tell you here, there is no teaching in the Tao teachings that says that we're obligated to be poverty-stricken, run around in sackcloth, and eschew all of the, uh, uh, the, the fineries of secular accomplishment. We are allowed to do very well professionally and personally in our secular lives, but we can't do that at the expense or sacrifice of the spiritual path. It is the spiritual path, the Tao teachings, the walk down the path, if you will, that is largely responsible for the ability to excel in the personal and professional life. And so the better able we are to cultivate the Tao teachings, the better able we are to stay on the path the more refined and improved the spiritual journey becomes, almost miraculously, the more refined and improved the professional and personal life becomes. I am a living example of that very thing. I've owned uh, two businesses in the last 10 years. Both of them uh, served their purpose for a while and both of them failed. But at no time, either while I was running them or afterwards, did we ever suffer for lack of income or any kind of want. What most people would see as being a horrible misfortune, the failure of a business, turned out in both cases to be a blessing and led me to exactly where I needed to be when I needed to be there. I find that, that the more closely I try to follow the teachings, the more miraculously my life seems to work out. And that is an astounding and wonderful and ever surprising thing to see. I'm reminded over and over again that by tending to the spiritual, the secular seems to work out on its own. And that's pretty cool. Every New Year's Eve, <laughs> either we are or we know people who are standing around singing Auld Lang Syne and making all kinds of resolutions, resolutions to lose weight, to finish a project here or there in the home, to find a better job, to be a better person, to quit a bad habit, smoking perhaps, uh, that's one of mine. 
And, and the one thing that most of those resolutions have in common is that they are primarily lip service to lofty goals with very little action behind them. I will uh, tell you all truthfully, I have tried for years uh, to quit smoking. I don't usually make New Year's resolutions about it, but I have never yet been successful at it. I've been successful at cutting down, but I've never been able to walk away from them. Interestingly, when Senior Master Yang spoke to me about that particular habit, what she told me was that when it was time for me to quit, I would. And that was the only thing she had to say. That day is getting closer, and I know it is, because the thought of not smoking isn't quite so scary to me. <laughs> it doesn't cause me as much stress as it once did, and I'm able to go for longer and longer periods without smoking. Uh, I don't get the opportunity at work much, and we don't really like to smoke here at home too much, so uh, I can see her point. One of these days here, sooner or later, I'm going to put that habit down and walk away from it. But until I can do that, I'm not going to tell anybody that that's uh, within my purview because I refuse to sit here and lie to you. If we're going to make the resolutions, maybe we ought to make them with a, a little bit of forethought and a little bit of a, a seriousness and take them as something that we need to do. My resolution, as it has been for the last 10 years, is to try to draw myself closer to the Tao itself. I practice Tai Chi and study these teachings because I find tremendous value in them. And I'm hoping one of these days that I'm going to practice my way into understanding them. And I can't wait to see what happens when I do. The simple fact of the matter is, we're real good at marking the passage of time. Other than that, the new year is simply another day. But on that day, because we mark that passage of time, we have the opportunity to put a peg in the ground there and change the norm. We can all move a step or two closer to the Tao. If we can find the courage to do what we can dream of, to do what we can wish, if we find within ourselves the self-discipline to forge the better person out of the person that we are. If we learn to trust ourselves enough to believe our intuition and follow that gut instinct that comes from the true self. And if we can free ourselves from our fears and our desires and our attachments. It is only in unattached action and walking the path of the teachings that we truly begin to become. Become what? That's up to everybody. I can't choose what anyone else here will become. I can only choose what I will become. We have a, an opportunity here to make things less about me and I and more about us, the great collective. We have the chance to give a little more. Is uh, anybody not hearing me at the moment? I just got a connection message. Huh. Unless somebody says something, I'm going to keep going. <laughs> you know, I, I tell my kids that nobody ever has so little that they don't have a little bit to share. And that's the truth. And so we have an opportunity perhaps to give just a little more to discover a deeper meaning in the Tao teachings. We have an opportunity to spend 364 full days trying to help each other instead of trying to hurt each other, to show a bit of compassion to our fellow man. And we have an entire whole new year 
to reach for our highest and best good and share that goodness with others. In the up and coming 365 days, perhaps we can draw ourselves a little closer to the divine essence. Perhaps this year we'll really unclutter our homes and our hearts and get rid of all the needless junk we've accumulated over the years. And in doing that, maybe we can make ourselves ready to receive the blessings that, that come with real spiritual cultivation. And as we receive them, we can share those with other people. We can become the source of blessings to others. And perhaps we can learn to be content. <laughs> Sounds like a tall order, doesn't it? But it really isn't so bad. You know, every year we approach the new year with a with a lot of hope and a bit of trepidation, a little anxiety, and, and a lot of good wishes. We wish and hope for things to be better, and we worry about the issues and problems that we drag along with us. And that's natural. But we have the ability to change that mix, to change that paradigm anytime we want. And the coming of the new year is actually the perfect symbolic time to consider doing those things, to do the things that really make a difference in our own lives and in the lives of others. You know, but in reality, absolutely every day that we wake up, is the beginning of the new year. So maybe instead of asking what we're going to do in 2015, maybe we can just ask, hey, what are we going to do tomorrow? Thank you all very much. It's always a pleasure to share with you. Hey, Bill, thank you. Um, this reminds me uh, to ask you, um, have you uh, have you by chance had a chance to uh, look at uh, you know my uh, my book with 365 pages, the Tao of Joy every day? I have not, but I need to. So there are many books out there uh, that is in that same format, uh, one page per day. Uh, quite a few of them have even. Uh, set it up to be uh, dates and month specific so it'll start out with January 1st and you know the book uh, one page per day the book ends on December 31st uh, I resisted that uh, for the same reason of your uh, last paragraph there you know every day is the beginning of a new year so rather than to call it out as a particular date, January, you know, one, first, second, third, etc. I just have numbers from one to 365, you know, because uh, should you decide to begin today, you know, 365 days later, uh, that's actually uh, a year's worth, a year's worth of reflection and uh, cultivation. And one thing that was uh, surprising to me was when my uh, when when people last uh, Derek which one of your books is the is the biggest one which is the one with the most content you know I responded to them by saying oh I think it's the Tao of success uh, this other book a collection of stories 25 stories in all and I said that because it's a lot thicker than its previous uh, book it's the sequel to the Tao of Daily Life, and it's like 50% uh, bigger than that book. Uh, when you uh, lay them out side by side, you can see that it's a lot thicker. Um, but then, surprise to me was that when I actually uh, took the manuscript and did a word count, it's actually the 365 pages book, the Tao of Joy, uh, you know, the Tao of Joy every day is actually is actually the biggest one of all. And that's because 365 pages really do add up to a lot of content. So I had no idea that it was uh, so much bigger 
uh, so much more material than the other than the other books. But but it's true, and it underlies the fact that if you can focus uh, on the Tao for a year, as with anything else in life, you can achieve uh, far more than perhaps you had expected when you began.